Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast. This is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of FinTech Nexus. I've been doing this show since 2013, which makes this the longest-running one-on-one interview show in all of FinTech. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you like this podcast, you should check out our sister shows, The FinTech Blueprint with Lex Sokolin and FinTech Coffee Break with Isabel Castro, or listen to everything we produce by subscribing to the FinTech Nexus podcast channel. Before we get started, I want to remind you that FinTech Nexus is now a digital media company. We have sold our events business and are 100% focused on being the leading digital media company for FinTech. What does this mean for you? You can now engage with one of the largest FinTech communities, over 200,000 people, through a variety of digital products, webinars, in-depth white papers, podcasts, email blasts, advertising, and much more. We can create a custom program designed just for you. If you want to reach a senior fintech audience, then please contact sales at fintechnexus.com today. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Eric Shoykat. He is the CEO and co-founder of Link Money. And Link Money is all about pay by bank. They have built a pay by bank platform that competes directly with uh, credit and debit cards. And obviously the reason to do this is because the processing fees for debit and credit cards continue to rise. Um, It's getting more expensive and paying by bank is simply uh, a less expensive alternative. So we talk about exactly how their system works, how they're rolling it out, where it makes sense to use. We talk about also why merchant fees are so expensive in the US, the most expensive in the world, in fact. We also talk about all the different types of payment methods that are available to consumers today, how they're going to win consumers over um, when it comes to sort of the the, the time of checkout when they're choosing a payment method. Uh, We talk about fraud prevention and we talk about the future of retail payments. It was a fascinating discussion. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So let's get started by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. You haven't, you don't have a long career because you're still very young, but tell us some of the highlights of what you've uh, what you've done so far to, um, in your career. Yeah, so I started uh, my career working at Blackstone in the restructuring group there after university, and then I went on to work at a hedge fund covering uh, a few different sectors, including industrials and, and financials, um, and after that. I decided to start a company called Adam Finance, which is in the, the fintech space, focused around investing in information and data. And after that, ultimately uh, founded Link Money, which is the company company I currently am CEO of and run and that we're chatting about today. And I have been doing that ever since. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the founding story for Link Money. What, what did you see and what was the impetus to start the company? So Link Money provides a pay-by-bank solution for enterprise merchants in the U.S. That's that's our bread and butter. That's what we focus on. The impetus for starting it really came about from you know my days covering financials. I actually spent some time um, at the hedge fund I worked at covering European financials specifically. And in Europe, pay-by-bank has has grown quite rapidly in the last decade or so, and has taken a lot of share from cards, um, both debit and credit. Obviously, debit's a bit more prevalent in, in, in Europe than, than credit is here in, in the US, but has grown to something like high teens percent of payment volume, digital payment volume in Europe. So saw that trend there um, and obviously was acutely aware of the cost of payments in the United States being pretty much the highest among any developed market in the world. And obviously, this is still the largest and deepest um, you know, economy and obviously e-commerce market and digital payments market in general. Um, versus you know some of these other countries in Europe. So it's the largest market. It has the highest payments cost. And it struck me as uh, somewhat of a no-brainer for someone to come in and, and focus on driving down those payment costs through a cheaper pay-by-bank offering like we do at Link Money with the view that you know merchants were reaching an inflection where the cost of payments was simply too high versus the value that uh, these offerings um, in terms of accepting card payments were, were providing to the merchant. And we had kind of hit... An inflection um, in that kind of cost value add uh, debate from a merchant standpoint. And then I think the second piece was 
um, from a, and we could talk more about this from a building perspective of the infrastructure available to, you know, need uh, to build a pay by bank solution that worked well in the US was finally there. And consumer behavior in terms of familiarity and um, I guess experience of, you know, account linking and bank account authentication had dramatically grown. And especially post COVID, that's something that most people at that point had, had finally seen. So I felt that, you know, we were there from a merchant perspective, we were there from an infrastructure perspective, and we were there from a consumer behavior and familiarity of the, the right UX perspective. Right. And with those kind of key ingredients felt that, the, you know, the timing was right to launch uh, an enterprise focused pay by bank offering in the US. Okay, so before we we dive into link money, I'd love to get your perspective on why you know we you you said that we have the highest payment processing costs in the world for for card payments. Why did it get that way? You know, it's kind of like healthcare in the sense that you know Europe obviously has way lower healthcare costs than the U.S. Uh, and some of that is because they're free riding on on kind of the high costs in the U.S. Right, and I think I think payments is somewhat similar in the sense that you know Europe is much more regulated. Um, there's much more strong centralized regulatory authority to drive those costs down. And with respect to payments, it, it really boils down to that. There's uh, much more regulation of open banking and, and card processing fees in Europe that have resulted in cheaper processing costs and more initial adoption around pay by bank in Europe. In the US, because we don't have that sort of regulatory environment where the government can kind of mandate uh, payment costs, obviously there's uh, the Durban Amendment inside the Dodd Frank, which specifically limits um, debit card, uh, you know, interchange fees um, for regulated debit cards, which is obviously only probably about a third of the debit card market uh, for the big banks. But basically, other than that, actually, before that, there was no regulation. So even now, there's still just that piece, right? So most of debit is unregulated, and obviously, credit is completely unregulated. Although there is, you know, there's been some talk in Congress of doing something. I think it's extremely unlikely. So the reality is most of the card processing market in the United States is unregulated. Um, and because of that, there is this oligopoly between Amex, Visa, and MasterCard. And the result of that has been, uh, you know, just empirically rising card processing costs and interchange fees over time. A lot of that increase has actually come, or a good chunk of that increase has actually come recently uh, post-COVID. And it, there's been basically the largest increase in, in card processing costs um, over the last five years versus kind of pretty much any other point over the last 40. So that has led to kind of acute merchant pain in terms of how much they're they're having to swallow to accept payments. And it, obviously, you know, for merchants, this isn't new. <laughs> you know, accepting payments is like not a new thing, right? Card processing right. is not a new thing. It's not like some new technology that came out of nowhere. It's the same cards, same network. The merchants are just trying to get paid. And so I think they're, because of that, um, I think, merchants at this point really see that the cost of accepting payments um, and the cost of accepting cards specifically is very disproportionate relative to the actual value add, which is, you know, it's a somewhat commodified task. You, you know, someone needs to just pay you. It's, again, it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing in digital payments and not a new thing in person payments. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and I think a lot of it's just due to this, you know, lack of regulatory infrastructure in the U.S. and, and the nature of the concentrated market of the three major networks versus the fragmented nature of the merchants. Obviously, if you had, you know, three card networks and, you know, it's just three uh, merchants on the other side, I, I think it may be a different kind of uh, negotiating dynamic, but that's just kind of the reality of the market structure. Right, right. Gotcha. Okay. So can you maybe just take us through how your offering works? I mean, what what do you need to do? Um, you said you're targeting enterprise, right? But how are you actually getting your offering into enterprises? So the, the merchant can either integrate our product directly or use a partner that we have that they may use for an orchestration layer or processing or uh, you know for their software. Um, it depends on the specific industry vertical and, and the nature of the merchant. But it can either be that sort of direct integration or basically flipping a switch if it's through one of our partners. And the way it kind of functions in the user experience is quite simple. There's going to be a button in the checkout flow that says pay by bank, or the merchant will text you a link or email you a link where you can click and go through the same flow. Once you click pay by bank, you'll basically select your bank and then either authenticate with face ID or enter your credentials. And you'll see a little spinner, and then hopefully it says, you know, payment successful. And that's basically 
the flow. There may be some uh, small additional steps for uh, you know secondary security measures and other things, depending on which bank you use and 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 how their um, normal kind of login flow is. But it's basically the same as if the end user was logging into their bank account through their mobile app or you know on a web browser. Are you linking through Plaid to get it all connected, or are you doing this? How, how are you actually getting them to link to their bank? Yeah, so we have several data access network partners, including uh, Akoya and, and Finicity that we work with, which is owned by MasterCard. Um, so they're very close partners of ours. Through our data access networks, we have, uh, for the vast majority of banks, uh, especially the large ones, you know, direct OAuth connections, which means these are um, extremely secure connections that there's no actual sharing of password or uh, user ID or any of that. Nothing is stored, nothing is screen scraped. It's basically the same as you directly logging into your bank account through a mobile app or a web browser. So that's how it actually functions. And then once you do this first time flow, the bank account is effectively saved or stored just like a card would on file. Um, Again, we don't store user credentials or anything like that, but it functions in the same way. There's a token. And so when the merchant wants to charge this account for, let's say, another month of a subscription, or you just want to buy something from this merchant again, and then you have the saved payment information, it functions just like a card. Um, that you would have saved in the merchant's profile. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. So you you talked about Europe, and uh, you know, I'm from Australia, where we've had we've had pay by bank. I mean, it's got to be 25 years now, um, though, where it's become pretty ubiquitous. No one's done this yet. You're not going up against sort of a an established incumbent. Why hasn't anybody done this yet in the US? Yeah, and that's it's a really good question. And actually, that goes to you know when we we're just talking about the what the product is and how it works before I think we can dig in a little more there because it gives clarity on why this is so difficult. So obviously the user flow and and the merchant experience of integrating this is pretty easy for the merchant. It's it's pretty it's not totally no code, but it's it's very low code and similar to integrating any other sort of payment method. So that all sounds well and good and, and is very easy. Under the hood, in terms of what we have to do, it's actually extremely complex. So the way the way we operate is and our goal is to turn this whole experience of pay by bank into basically a card like replacement for the merchant. So at checkout, the merchant knows the money's good. The funds are guaranteed. They show up in the merchant's account in, you know, one or two days, T plus one, T plus two, same as cards. Um, and it's a very seamless UX for the customer. So that all is intended to make, you know, the merchant feel like this is no different or no worse than accepting a card. And the kicker of course, is we tend to charge merchants 70 to 80% less for processing than cards. So that's usually in the 1% to 1.2% range in terms of processing costs. Cards are often well north of 2%. A lot of the merchants we deal with pay 25 or even more. And our value prop to these merchants is, you know, we lower your processing costs and we also help reduce fraud, both actual and friendly, because it's a much more secure payment method. So that's just zooming out like what the, the value prop is to the, the merchant and, and how it's exactly pretty much apples to apples versus cards. The reason this is so complicated is because under the hood, there is no actual real-time account to account payments in the US. We obviously have Fed now, so that enables for the select banks that are starting to adopt it, and basically that's no one yet. But when that does happen, um, there will be credit push account to account money movement. That means that the user needs to approve every transaction and authenticate each transaction. So it cannot work like card on file, like what we talked about before, which obviously from a merchant standpoint, it's really not good, right? That actually eliminates a lot of the use cases. So we will have that in the US, but that's basically it. So ultimately we have to move money on the ACH network. So what does that mean? That means that the money is not moved in real time. It, it can take several days or longer. There's actually a period also where the customer can can kind of recall the money or, or dispute the, uh, the transaction, which has a, a decent tail to it. And so because of all these things with ACH, it makes it extremely difficult to offer pay by bank in the United States. In the other markets we talked about, uh, I don't know Australia as well, but I believe this is true. I know for sure in Europe, uh, if you look at India with UPI or PIX in Brazil, there's real-time account-to-account money movement, right? Right. So once you have real-time account-to-account money movement, the processor or the pay by bank provider doesn't need to guarantee the money, right? It's it's just, it moves in real time. You see if the person has enough money, they do, great, the money moves and that's it, right? Obviously there, there's some complexity to it, but that's, that's you know much easier in the U.S. because we have ultimately uh, ACH as as the bedrock of what we're using. What we need to do then is to figure out: Does this person have enough money in their account 
to pay this and we can't move the money in real time. So that's why we guarantee the money to the merchant. So merchants don't have to worry about any of this complexity, but under the hood, we have to pull information from on your account. We have to decision you in real time. We have to actually move the money over a period of a few days. And obviously we're on the hook if there turns out to be insufficiency of funds. So that makes this very complicated. It's actually, you know, all this decisioning, you, you need a whole decision engine, you need to pull in all this customer data uh, on the account um, and, and on the, the profile of the person to make this sort of decision. So because of this lack of real-time uh, account to account money move in the US, this becomes a much, much more complicated exercise. That's number one. Number two, um, there is in these other markets, true open banking access. So what that means is that the ability to pull in account, bank account information and kind of account and routing number, things like that, is pretty much legislated in Europe. So everyone, the banks have to make that available. In the United States, we don't have that sort of regulatory framework at all. The CFPB recently released some rules on open banking that's gonna kind of make this easier. But the reality still is this is very much a bank by bank type of thing. Um, there is some standardization, but it's still very different. And we obviously have 10,000 banks in the United States. So we have to work with our data access network partners to make sure these connections work, to make sure the information is sent to us in a consistent way. And there's a lot of complexity in how different banks report different things. It's something as simple as, you know, the way banks label transactions in the account history, um, they do it differently. So something you think that if you get this sort of specific code, it means something. And then for another bank, it means something else, right? And that sort of data is essential to us when we're looking at the account information to make sure that this person has, you know, it's not a, a fraudulent account, there is enough money. Because again, ultimately, we're, you know, on the hook for that risk over some number of days to ensure it settles, because we're guaranteeing that money to the merchant. So all this complexity kind of um, bubbles up into you needing to build a, a really robust product and infrastructure. And ultimately, you know, as a pay by bank provider in the United States, we really are the payment method. We're both the merchant acquirer and the processor and the payment method. So we're doing all of those pieces versus, you know, if you look at cards, you have those pieces split up between several parties. Yep. Yep. So then what, what sort of coverage do you have as far as, you know, the banks you mentioned, 10, there's 10,000 banks and credit unions in this country. If you're, you know, you, you bank with a small credit union or a small community bank, are you going to be able to use, you know, pay by bank uh, through link money? So we have 95% of all bank accounts in the United States. There's obviously a lot of banks. Um, the big banks still do represent a nice, healthy chunk of, of the basically the total deposit accounts in the U.S. But we have you know well north of ninety percent coverage in the U.S. in terms of deposit accounts. So most folks will be able to use this pay by bank product, pretty much irrespective of who they bank with. Okay, okay. So it's pretty obvious what's in it for merchants. They have you know the credit card fees are going up. This is a much cheaper alternative. But what is in it for consumers? Because I like, for me personally, I like to play the credit card rewards game. Um, and there's a lot of people that do that, also many that don't. But what, how do you get consumers to adopt this, this new method? Yeah, I think first principles, this is uh, a really simple user experience and is more secure than using a card. So for a lot of the major banks, this flow will basically just take you to your uh, mobile app for the bank that you use, and you're just going to authenticate with Face ID. So in many respects, uh, it's less friction than actually entering your card information for the merchant. It'll be kind of a, a very easy and secure user experience. You don't have to give the merchant your your card number, your expiry, your CVC. So again, it's it's, it's a very seamless UX and actually is is more secure. Um, taking a step back, look, there, there's obviously folks who who care a lot about their their credit card rewards. That's definitely a segment of the market, but you know, as we talked about before, you know, debit is actually thirty percent of payment volume and digital payment volume in the U.S. It actually exceeds credit, um, and then within that, two thirds of that debit volume is fully unregulated. So merchants are actually paying a lot of money for this unregulated debit volume, and the customer is not getting any you know rewards for that. And then even with credit, you know, a lot of the the cards don't actually have high rewards, and a lot of folks just use the credit card in in many contexts. Um, even when they're buying from a known merchant, not for credit ex extension or to be able to dispute or anything like that. It's just because, you know, that's what they pull out of their wallet. So I think the reality is that adoption ultimately will have to, you know, initially come from merchants pushing this. And that's what we see. Um, and there's a lot of merchants we work with that can be, um, you know, creative about how they get consumers to adopt. That means putting this in a, in a certain place in the user experience 
That means doing marketing campaigns. And that ultimately may mean giving some incentives, uh, you know, giving some cash back, giving some discounts, giving some rewards, especially for merchants that have strong rewards programs and know their customer well. And so that's the sort of behavior that we see from merchants in terms of getting uh, and giving consumers an added incentive um, to kind of share in the reduction of overall processing costs that the merchant is benefiting from. So then when it comes to adding merchants, I presume, is this live today? Are there people processing yes. volume right now? So how are you how are you approaching sort of the, I imagine you're not going around to the local coffee shop and asking them to join Link Money, but uh, are you targeting like big e-commerce companies? What? How are you rolling this out? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So well, we, the way we think about the world in terms of who should adopt this is we're very focused on ultimately what's the savings through the value chain and like what's the savings to the merchant. So we want to focus on areas, and, and this is, sounds uh, obvious, but it's worth saying, we want to focus on areas where this product makes sense. And what I mean by that is it does not make sense for us to push a coffee shop to adopt this for a customer that's coming in and spending $5 on a cup of coffee, right? That's just not, there's not enough value added in, in, in dollar savings there for that. Where this does make sense is where there's a repetition of purchase between this the customer and the merchant. So the customer is buying from that merchant somewhat regularly. It could be uh, you know, a few, only a few times a year. It could be every month. It could be several times a month. It could be daily. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is the purchase amount needs to be not like a few dollars. Um, so usually we like to see purchase amount at least 10 or $15 per transaction, ideally maybe more in the 15 to $20 range. And in that kind of intersection of some repetition of purchase and at least kind of 10 or $15 per transaction, the economics for the merchant and the economics of the savings make a lot of sense. The dollars are real, right? So those are the types of areas we focus on. So to give you specific examples, um, we like high rep repetition e-commerce. So that could be something like uh, Amazon where you're buying very regularly. That could be something like an Uber or DoorDash or something where, again, you're buying very Instacart, wherever you, you use for kind of weekly ordering, let's say. Um, it could be subscriptions. So it could be a Netflix subscription. It could be a Dropbox subscription. It could be Spotify, anything that's very repetitive um, subscription based, so, which is usually monthly. So it could be things like that. Um, and then it could also be, you know, a lot of verticals in that are not related to, you know, the obvious ones of e-commerce. So we have uh, merchants in the parking space. Um, parking's great because uh, a lot of folks, park, you know, pay for uh, parking on a monthly basis or park, you know, every day. It's very recurring. Storage units, insurance. You know, we have um, merchants that we're, we're working with in the charity space. Um, it's a, it's another good one where people are, you know donating regularly and, and often the card processing costs are very high. So there's a lot of these areas where, again, there's a known merchant and, and a known customer and they're giving to that merchant, you know, regularly, often on auto pay, right? You think about your, you know, if you have a storage unit, you just have a card on file, you don't think about it, you know, a few hundred dollars a month for a storage unit turns into very, very expensive processing costs um, for that provider. So those are the types of verticals we like. Um, and those are areas where pay by bank just drives a lot of savings. And it really doesn't make sense in, in those categories for necessarily that that um, money to be moving on card rails. Right, right. So, you know, let's talk about the, the payments rails for a second, because there's there's new things coming on. There's new blockchain um, focused ones. We've got, you know, there's there's pays that hasn't hasn't launched yet, which I imagine you would consider maybe a direct competitor. Buy now, pay later is everywhere. You go. So a lot of these places and you you can see you can pay with Amazon at a, at a different uh, different places. So how are you kind of looking at the competitive landscape here? And is there a concern that maybe consumers are just going to get overwhelmed with too many options? I think fundamentally, there needs to be a payment method in the United States that's new, that's cheaper. And again, that sounds like an obvious comment, but a lot of these innovations are more expensive payment methods, right? You go back to Apple Pay. Apple Pay is a more expensive payment method. It's Apple adding another fee on top of card rails. You look at BNPL. BNPL is, is well, I think it's uneconomic and, and doesn't really make sense, but that's a separate conversation, but it's more expensive. And, and the reason it's more expensive is because the default rates on these BNPL loans are extremely high. And, and you know, generally speaking, in a lot of cases, you're extending credit to people who ought not to have credit or, or you know, aren't, you know, good counterparties or, or good risk for these sorts of transactions. So because of that, uh, the cost of BNPL for a lot of these merchants is five, 6%. Again, it's a much more expensive payment method. And in a lot of cases, actually, the repayment, as insane as this sounds, the repayment of the BNPL loan is on card rails. So wow. you're literally, it's another expensive layer on card rails, which is wild. 
you know, Amazon pay, waving your hands, whatever, all these things, again, it's, it's just a, a easier UX on top of card rails. So what we need in this country is fundamentally a cheaper payment method, um, because that's what merchants need, because the cost of processing is divorced of the value that it's providing at this point. So that's what we're doing. Pay by bank is truly a significantly cheaper payment method. It's 60 to 70% cheaper for a lot of the merchants we work with. And that is real disruption, real innovation. A lot of these other payment methods, again, are, are just you know nicer UXs or whatever, but again, on top of uh, card rails, and, and that just makes them unsustainable and more expensive in a lot of respects. So we're truly trying to, to actually lower processing costs. Um, and that doesn't mean these other payment methods won't be, exist and, and aren't useful in certain respects, but for a lot of the verticals we focus on, uh, ultimately what, what's gonna really matter for these merchants is, is, is cheaper cost of processing. And you're actually seeing other payment methods um, whether that be PayPal or BMPL losing share at this point, because their merchants are figuring out basically, you know, I think this mentality has shifted and is helping us. There was a mentality of offer every payment type under the sun. That was the old merchant mentality. Just offer everything, let the consumer choose. What merchants are finding out is that when they pull some of these more expensive payment methods, you know, take PayPal as an example, that volume is just going to cards at lower cost, right? Because PayPal tends to be more than cards, for example. And so now merchants are being much more selective and think through, okay, what do I really need to offer? Um, and, you know, I think a mix of cards and pay by bank makes a lot of sense because, you know, some of that volume will go onto the cheaper rails of pay by bank. A lot of it will still be on cards. And then you won't have the same necessarily a volume going through, let's say something like PayPal, which is, or BMPL, which are both even more expensive than cards. Right. Well, what about digital wallets though? Because, um, I'd be curious about what you think. You know, I use Apple Pay all the time. You know, I can go into Apple Pay and use my Apple Cash balance to pay for something at checkout, which I don't think flows over card rails, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. But I mean, I could imagine this pay by bank being part of Apple Pay or Google Pay. I mean, what do you, is that sort of a, what you're thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is going to be just another payment method. So you'll have your cards, You'll have a pay by bank, you may still have PayPal. Um, and this is just going to be another payment method that people use. I think what's great about pay by bank and, and what's going to be key and helpful to the adoption, unlike something like, let's say, crypto or BMPL, this just functions with your existing bank account. So you, the user doesn't need to do anything, right? There's no sign up, there's no separate flow, there's no separate app, there's no other currency they need to do. This just works and uh, functions with your existing bank account. That's it. You're just authorizing with your existing bank account. So by definition, pretty much, obviously, we don't cover every single one of the 10,000 banks, but we cover, let's say, 95% of U.S. deposit accounts. 95% of people in the United States can use pay by bank already without needing to do anything, just simply going through the basic initial flow. Um, and that's what's so great about it, uh, because customers are already set up to leverage this without needing to you know, do something or, or sign up for something else. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so last question then. I want to sort of, if you could sort of look into your crystal ball and give me a, a vision for the future of, of retail payments. And the same time, maybe, you know, obviously, you, I'm sure your vision includes link money being wildly successful, but what are the challenges that you need to overcome to actually achieve that vision? Yeah. So I think if you look, let's say 10 years from now, I think digital payments are going to comprise basically credit and debit cards and pay by bank. I think you're going to see PayPal effectively disappear over the next 10, 10 years. Um, I don't think there's really a true use case anymore for most merchants. Um, and I think BMPL is unsustainable and will also, you know, it, in a large respect, disappear uh, because the model doesn't work. So I think ultimately what you're going to have is you're going to have your higher cost payments, which is going to be credit cards. Uh, you're going to have your middle ground, which is going to be uh, debit. And I think pay by bank will take a lot of share from debit and, and a bit from credit as well uh, over the next 10 years. And I think you'll see it evolve in many respects like it has in, in Europe, where it'll be at some point some double digit percent of digital payment volume. Um, and you'll see both debit and credit probably come down a bit. And then I think you'll see a good amount of share loss from uh, PayPal and BNPL. So that's my kind of overall prediction. I think that's just going to be a function of payment volume looking for cheaper rails. And again, the reason the reason why it's not going to be everything and, and this isn't a zero sum game is because there is a lot of volume that should be on, you know, uh, credit cards, let's say, right? If you're buying from, you know, merchant you don't know, it's travel related things, maybe you want to be able to cancel more easily. There, there's a lot of, there are use cases, right? You need credit extension. So 
that will continue, obviously. But there's a lot of volume which has no business being on expensive rails, um, where it's kind of a recurring purchase between a known customer and a known merchant. And the merchant can encourage and better incentivize adoption on cheaper rails. So I think that's how the market's going to evolve. Um, in terms of challenges, look, any new payment method has challenges in terms of getting consumers to adopt, right? It's no different than, you know, I, I, I remember, let's say, you know, six, seven years ago where people were saying that wallets would never become popular in the US, right? And wallets had been very popular in places like China and Europe. And lo and behold, wallets are now popular in the US. Um, and so the US just tends to be a little bit slow on adopting payment methods. Um, I think we're, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> There's a bunch of reasons where it's a more fragmented ecosystem. There's less regulation. Consumers are maybe a little less on the bleeding edge of the tech curve when it comes to payments versus some other markets. But ultimately, these things happen in the US just like they do in other markets. So I think this whole notion that pay by bank won't take a lot of share in the US is, is incorrect. And I think it's going to evolve similarly to other markets just on a lag, um, both because of you know maybe some of this consumer behavior, but also just because the infrastructure and the money movement hasn't, uh, in terms of real-time account to account, money movement hasn't been here in the US. So we've overcome a lot of those obstacles to build a product that works easily. But of course, look, consumer adoption always takes some time. It's going to take merchants to, to drive this and to educate consumers. But the good news is that I think merchants have had a come to Jesus moment and are at the point where they can't put up with these high costs of payment processing fees anymore. And so they are aggressively pushing and thinking about pay by bank. And that will ultimately drive consumer engagement. And as consumers become more familiar with it and see it's an easy UX and are getting some incentives and discounts and rewards for merchants to adopt, I think they're just going to naturally get more familiar and, and want to use it more, just like has happened with other payment methods. Right. Okay. Well, we'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Eric, um, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Best of luck. And uh, let's uh, let's see if the US can follow the, the lead of, of other countries there. So anyway. Thanks for coming on. See ya. Thanks for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please go ahead and give the show a review on the podcast platform of your choice and go tell your friends and colleagues about it. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.